Good evening and welcome to this edition of Middlesex Update. I'm your host, Melissa Hurley, and today we are in the heart of Davis Square. We're here with a man about town, Bob Publicover, who many of you know if you live in Somerville, but also I'm sure if you live outside of Somerville, you know him as well. Bob is the publisher and editor of the Somerville News, and today we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about his the other organizations that he's very active in. Bob, first of all, thank you for being on Middlesex Update. Good to be here. Well, we're, we're um, glad to have you, and it's interesting, you know, we're here in Davis Square. You've been here for about 13 years with Somerville News, and you've probably seen Davis Square flourish from what was what most would consider just any old square, you know, the same as Ball Square, um, Magoon Square, every other square, into what was called one of the five hippest squares in the United States. Tell me a little bit about the transformation you've seen take place right before your eyes. It must be fun to kind of walk around the neighborhood when you've always been here and see all the tourists and college kids and yuppies that, you know, are just moving in here. I've watched it go from one chain, one extreme to another. Mm -hmm. um, I was born a block from Davis Square, so even though the paper's only been here for a short time, I've literally been here right. for my entire life. When I was a kid on a Friday night at this time of year near the holidays, there were five major food stores, Stop and Shop, A&P, First National, Star Market. There were major department stores, Grant's, Kresge's, Woolworth's, Park Snow's, and it was booming. You couldn't even walk in the streets. Fifteen years later, the square was half empty as the different malls and other places right. opened up. And when we fought to bring in the red line nearly 20 years ago, mm -hmm. the square was on, on its deathbed. And the red line has brought new life and new kinds of businesses and new people to Davis Square. Very few franchises, which I think is will be the secret to Davis Square. We're not a ton of franchises. Most places you go to, the owner will probably wait on you or at least be out back, whether it be baking, cooking, mm -hmm. or writing insurance policies. And that must be nice to you because, I mean, you know, you're the publisher of this paper, and I think, from what I understand, from always when I'm reading the paper, it has a very local flavor. It's not um, one of those chain papers where they just take pull news from the AP. You know, you have local stories, you have editors and reporters in here that write the local news, and that must be heartening as well when you go into all the different um, stores and see the, you know, the owner helping you and everything. Most of the people who are originally customers or just store people are friends of mine now. Yeah. It makes a big difference when everybody knows. It's, it keeps the neighborhoods -y feeling. Um, one of the slogans of Davis Square, which I invented 20 years ago, is where the merchants know you. And it's so true. Everybody knows everybody by name. And it makes such a difference to a mall mm. where, you know, it's just kids at a counter. Right. Now look around your office, and I know that Joe has some. Is going to show some photos. I mean, you've really been with everyone. There's pictures up here with you and Register of Deeds, Gene Brune. Um, we have Senator Kennedy over at Mike's Restaurant, and as I see, you both have a reserved ta table just for the two of you. Um, you're with former Governor Ed King. What's it like um, meeting with all those people? But you know, ta talking to them about your issues and really just hanging out with them. It's really enjoyable. I mm -hmm. find every last one of them to be very down to earth. Um, back when the Herald of the Globe were picking on them, or when they were brand new in politics, people like Bill Weld or, or Ed King, um, when no one else would talk to them, no one had heard of them. And they'd call me and ask, gee, would you interview me? I'm running for governor. I was like, of course I would. I don't turn anybody down. You must have some interesting stories. Oh, I, Ed King, I was his first interview and his very last interview the day before he went out as governor. Really? I was his favorite newspaper man, which for Ed King was not easy. But we stuck it out all those years, and I get to know most of these people early on mm -hmm. in politics. Uh, Scott Hoshbacher was another one mm -hmm. when nobody would endorse him, and I did. I had a lot of long shot endorsements over the years that might not have won the first time, but eventually ended up in office. That includes Bill Clinton. Um, and every last one of them is very down to earth. You can still pick up the phone and call any of them. Um, you can talk about issues day to day, whether it be local issues or um, I'm Mike Capuano's GLBT, gay, lesbian, mm -hmm. liaison, those issues, AIDS issues, when I first announced to the world that I was HIV positive, and these were the first people to pick up that phone and either check on me or check on someone in their office when they find out they were. So it, it's just great to know people like that and to know how they're very, and to know them as real people, not big shots, just regular down-to-earth people. All right, we definitely have an interesting job, and let's talk about the newspaper for a little while. Um, You've been publishing the paper for 13 years. Well, it's actually, it's, it's longer now. Uh, I've been in okay. Davis Square for 13 years. Oh, okay. um, next year will be my 23rd year as the owner That's since I started news. it again. Great, great. And tell me, how has the news industry for you um, changed over the years? You know, as you were saying earlier, there aren't as 
many years ago, the newspaper was the primary source of news, and there were many little newspapers throughout different towns. And now it seems like nowadays all of the weekly papers are owned by chain newspapers. And how's it been? What's that been like for you? Well, in some ways, it's been an advantage because the chain newspapers will assign a story. Okay, you're doing the mayor's finances this week. And whether it be Mayor McGlynn or Mayor Menino or Mayor Dark Gay, every single one of their papers does the same story in a different way. Right. And that doesn't always fit. Where I can tailor make my stories, I don't do a lot of hard news. I got the Globe and the Herald and the Tab and TV and radio. So we kind of try to be like the People magazine of Somerville. We talk about people, places, things, businesses, schools, education, real down to earth neighborhood type things. I think one of our jobs is to keep Somerville a neighborhood city. And the only way you can do that is to let people know what's really going on. And by having lived in the city all my life, mm -hmm. and by still doing a lot of this myself, in fact, my friends think I spend more of my life in coffee shops than the office, which is true, <laughs> but I get more done. But you get some good stories, And I I'm learn sure. more. That's why I can do the stories. I'll overhear someone else's conversation, or someone will stop by and tell me, and they know their secrets are safe with me, mm -hmm. and I'll go to jail just like any other good reporter before I'll tell my sources. Mm -hmm. And so they're not afraid, especially the longer I've been in the business, and the more they realize they can tell me anything, they tell me anything. Have you found, that's interesting you say that you, you spend a lot of time in coffee shops and you maybe talk to this person or talk to that person, they may inspire a story, tell you some information you are interested in. Have you found that over the years your um, ways for gathering news have changed or have they still been down to the basics talking to people? Mostly just talking to people, listening. Um, we might get some press releases, but they're pretty, you know, just bleh, shallow mm -hmm. press releases typically mm -hmm. written. And I find that 90% of it comes from either people coming to me and say, gee, you should write a story on this, and even more just listening constantly. There's a million stories out there. I think that was a slogan for a TV show at some point in life, but there are, there's a million stories out there, and if you listen, and I'm forever jotting down little notes when I overhear them one way or another, and trying to give people credit where it's due, which often doesn't happen. And you're also a columnist. Not only do you own the paper, you write a, um, a regular column. Tell me a little bit about that and how it's changed over the years. I started writing that column in 1969 when I was 19 years old for what was then a political rag owned by a local landlord, started for a campaign. Um, it was called Youth Tells It Like It Is. Uh, that's what got me interested in the newspaper business. I did not go to journalism school. Uh, and I wrote for the Sunville Times off and on for 10 years and then it folded. They just wasn't the interest anymore. Um, I've got myself in a lot of trouble. Eventually we changed it from youth tells it like it is for obvious reasons, and it became blunt, bluntly speaking. Um, and I say what I think. Um, I have had several prominent people not speak to me even recently, um, because they don't like what I say. But they learn to respect what I say, that I treat everybody equally, I try to keep my integrity, and I'm always totally honest in that column. What would you say your favorite story has been over the years? Hmm, usually picking on politicians that need to be picked on. Or um, talking about things that need to be done in the city to help people. People, whether, and again, I've worked at Sunville High Scholarship Foundation, I've worked mm -hmm. with my church, I've worked with various AIDS groups. There's still too many people that aren't getting served out there, and, and we have to keep bringing that out because the, um, the poor people get forgotten too easily. Very true. And, um, you know, it's because you're talking about different political stories that you've written and politicians, but, you know, honestly, when I think of some real news, there are usually, I like the, the front page, um, second page talks all the little political tidbits that are going on mm -hmm. in the city, but I find it more of a human interest paper. I mean, there's always talking about different charity events and whether it be the high school or the AIDS organization or a church. It seems to me there's always different organizations that are talking about you know, their events, which is nice. It keeps it local and tells people what, what's going on. And also, especially in this economy, it shows you how you can support your local community. There's so many out there, there really working are. so hard that don't get credit, whether it be Kiwanis, Lions, Rotary, Visiting Nurses, Little Sisters of the Poor, the Somerville Home, and I could go on and on and on and on. Yeah, you could. <laughs> and in just a small place like Somerville. Um, and other cities are the same. It doesn't matter. Med Medford, Malden, Stoneham, all these organizations that just very quietly work very, very hard to, to help people, whether it be whether giving them money or, or things, or volunteering. I, mean, I can go out this week in Davis Square, and we decided instead of doing a raffle this year in the square, we donated a turkey for every single business that went in the promotion. Well, I was up to 35 turkeys today. And other stores said, well, I don't want to give just one turkey. How about I, can I donate for two or three? And that's the people, the unsung heroes is still a little, little guy, a little woman. And you're definitely an, an advocate for the unsung heroes. Um, since September 11th, they've, well, there's been a lot of talk about different local charities 
really not getting the cha the donations that they count on every year because there have been so many people that have given to more national charities. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that here in Somerville? Very much so. I run a race, um, a walk, and a barbecue, which we had combined. And normally I would make $15,000, which is not a lot, but it isn't bad either. I made five this year. Really? And I'm going to have to do a special letter in December, so send mm -hmm. money, folks. <laughs> but to show one third of what we normally make, yeah. um, my invitations arrived on September 12th. Really? Which you know, I wouldn't have read it. So mm -hmm. it just, thanks to the banks and some of the other big businesses giving me money, but we're going to have to do another fundraiser because it's going to hurt a lot of local charities, a lot of local arts groups who get their money. And people just, it's not just that they went to New York, people aren't spending. Right. And they don't want to go out to Times, fancy or otherwise, right now. Mm -hmm. So people have got to, we have to get back out to them because the need doesn't get any less. I want to move on to um, to talk about your AIDS committee that you're involved in, but just one last question about the newspaper. Do you think in 20 years will you still be around? What are your goals for the future as far as the paper is concerned? If someone wants to come by and give me a million dollars, come by. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, so you're gonna, I'm you're gonna, backing you're gonna off be, a little you're, bit. Um, you're trying out for who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, yes. I'm trying to back off a little bit. It's 23 years um, and longer than that if you count the time I've been writing mm, for it. But definitely. I still like it. And my idea is even sometimes, and I do get a little tired of it once in a while, like anybody in a job, but I just try to make changes in it, and I try to make the paper better. Uh, I hope this issue in December will be our first f full color front page ever. Great. So if I'm going to be here, I'm going to keep it in the best we can possibly Look forward to it. Any aspiring words to any uh, journalists out there? We cover all of Middlesex County, so I'm sure there's a few who are watching and you know, are taking the journalism classes at high school. Any, any words of wisdom to them? I would tell them to learn a lot about a newspaper and how to do it. My editors learn how to write, how to typeset, how to lay out, how to get the stories, how to wash the floors. Too many people, too many young people today think they're going to be at the New York Times tomorrow. Well, they're not. They're going to start at a place like the Sunville News, work their way up to a Herald or a Globe. Mm -hmm. um, don't try to be everything all at once, but learn as much about a, a newspaper as you can if you're interested, or any field of communication. You can't just be an anchor. You can't just be a writer. The more you know about the whole organization, the more you have a chance of getting to the top. Those are great words to live by. And, you know, I know the newspaper is one of your passions, but you're also a man of giving. You've been working with the AIDS Foundation for many years. Um, tell me a little bit about your involvement and I'd like to talk about your two books. I had started when one of my friends died of a mysterious disease in 1981, which didn't even have a name. They, they thought it was walking pneumonia, and it was found out later to be um, HIV as it was coming in. That was when several other friends died. Um, I was in my early 30s, and so we started the Committee for Response to AIDS, one of the, the third oldest AIDS organization in New England. Mm -hmm. Um, and for the first few years, we actually just put the money away because no one really needed it yet. Right. And then when things came on hard and strong, it was right around that time that I find, found out I was positive. So I just kept doing what I'd been doing and raising. Um, on my own AIDS basis, I'm the fluke. I'm unofficially the longest AIDS person in America, which I guess that makes it the world. And I've never had a sick day, so they study me to find out why. Dumb luck, but I don't try to put it to anything else these days. Um, we try to raise money and do unusual things for it. The federal government, who gives people money, and we get, mine is all private, has so many rules and regulations. And by me being malevolent... Rules and regulations as far as what you can use the money for? What you can spend for? your money okay. for. Uh, benevolent, benevolent dictator is what they call me on the board, because I pretty much decide where the money goes and my board goes along with it. But we sent a kid home to Nashville for his last Christmas. Uh, we buy the turkeys. We do 100 gift packs. We serve 15,000 meals at the local Methodist Church over 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, just today I bought a computer for a kid who's stuck in the house. I sent another kid on a three-day vacation to Florida. That's amazing. Um, that must make you feel really oh, good. Oh, it's too. great because it's things that the little things when these guys or women are on disability, they can't do this. They mm -hmm. can't afford these things. I had a woman come to me to pay her car insurance last year because no one will do that. So I take our money and I use it for very unusual things that nobody else will. How do you for. find out about these different cases? Is it just word of mouth, or how do you make the and how do you make the decision as to who is going to benefit? Um, it's mostly word. And mostly people come to me. I've been doing it. That's the advantage of doing these things for a long time. Right. When someone comes up with a weird problem, somebody will say, "Go see Bob Public over. He'll get your money." <laughs> and and I do if I can. Mm -hmm. um, we set a limit of three or four hundred dollars for any one person, um, and very very few come in here that we can't find some way to help. If I can't help them specifically. 
I can send them in a direction where they can find help. Um, that's another thing after doing that, the AIDS work for 18 years, I know where the help is. Right. So if I can't specifically give it to them, I can send them in a good direction for it. And Bobby, written two books, and I can see them for a second. And which one was your first book? The blue one. The blue one. My unicorn has gone away. Life, death, grief, and living in the years of AIDS. And when did you write this? I wrote that after my partner John died. Um, so a few years ago. We had met in a bar, mm -hmm. and I had gone up with the great line and said, "What are you doing for the next six months?" And John looked at me and said, "That's it." Well, we spent the next ten years together, and he died almost ten years ago. He's one of the very early people to die of AIDS. And I wrote the book. I didn't write it as a book. It was mostly meanderings and stories and prose and a little bit of everything. Yeah, there are poems in here. And a number and of people asked me about publishing it as a book. Well, I had no idea that first time things like that don't do real well. Well, mine did great. We did sold it? out two printings. That's great. That's wonderful. I got letters. The most wonderful thing about that book was I got letters from all over the world. I write letters to authors. I don't get them. And I have this big, thick folder that people sent me that had helped them back then, because it was written at the you know, right place, right time. I just happened to get lucky. That must be such a tribute to John as well. It is, definitely. And this one was written a few years ago, I believe, right? Yep, that one took me a long time to get it. It's basically the story of when John was sick. Mm -hmm. And after I wrote the first book, so many parents, when uncles and brothers were dying, they asked, how do I talk to my young kids about AIDS? So that's written and illustrated by a friend of mine. I did the writing, he did the illustrations. Um, we now have it online at UncleJohnny.com. That's great. Um, and it's all a true story, everything in there, and it's written for third and fourth graders. So we got, oh, I don't know, about 5,000. A lot of them sold. It's on Amazon.com. And my committee bought the last 2,000, and we're giving them to schools all over the country. We just sent one to every school in the Boston school system. We're sending one to every school in the New York school system, and we're just going to keep doing that That's until great. we run out of books. That's great. And you know, what do you say to parents when you meet them and they ask you how do they talk to their kids or about, about, their, about themselves, their aunt, their uncle? It's much easier today because AIDS is no longer a death sentence. Right. Um, the kids today that are becoming positive that don't need to, and that's one of the reasons because they just don't think, they never saw the war mentality that we saw when, you know, three out of my five best friends died, my partner died, and tons and tons of people, and it, its own form of um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, is just to have people die. And I was diagnosed with that, and I kind of laughed at the therapist. And I said, you know, what's the difference between being right in the middle of hundreds of people dying of AIDS or people around you dying in a war? It's not much different. Mm. And I don't think you ever totally recover. Um, friends are hard to find. You, the friends you knew for 20 years, now you got to maybe try again, but there's no guarantees. So you, just, you learn to live each day as best you can. And just especially because the holidays are coming up, um, you know, you said this one is online. If anybody wanted these, they could contact me at the Somerville News. I do have, I have a lot of copies of the children's book and a few left of the original Unicorn book. And they're also on Amazon? Yes, they're both on Amazon.com. You know Every now and then I get a check for $11. At the beginning of the dollars. holiday season, they say that Amazon.com is doing very well, and especially the internet. internet. A lot of people are um, doing online shopping this year when mm -hmm. they can. I have my first Amazon.com check still for $11, <laughs> the last of the Stephen King Big Millionaires. Hey, all those eleven dollars add up to something. I'm, I'm waiting any day now. They will. <laughs> I'm working on a play, a one-man show, oh, and really? another book. My biggest problem is sitting down and doing it. Well, you're so busy. I mean, you're you're doing this, you're doing that, and but it's all for a good cause. Um, and as you said, you, you, um, when you talk to people about AIDS, you're saying you're talking to parents about how to talk to their kids, but just when you you go out and you talk to many different groups, I'm sure. Um, what do you find is the biggest misconception about the condition? Today it's really hard. It's, it's just not so much a misconception as typical youth know nothing's ever going to kill them. You know, they just don't understand death. They haven't been out there. And they just think, the line you hear in the psychiatrist, they think they're immortal. And I'm sure none of us were any different. And that's the biggest problem. So I, I get yelled at at schools. I preach safe sex more than I do abstinence. And then teacher will come over and intermission and say, well, I'm talking about abstinence. So I do a little bit. But I'm also not dumb. I know what goes on out there. Um, I've seen things online with the, our parents told us how we were so much younger when we learned about sex. And yet, the other night I was in a chat room, it was a gay chat room, people need to be talked to, and I believe in that. That's the only way you make one-on-one, -on -one. there's nothing like it. I've got the experience and 
I've worked with kids and young men in Demolay, which is age 13 to 21. I've worked with that church. So I'm still somewhat on their level, not as much as I'd like to be, and I need to get back into youth work. Well, you also worked with the mayor and now the congressman, Congressman mm -hmm. Capuano, um, talking to the high school students or talking to the students of Somerville and the surrounding towns. I'm everybody's GLBT liaison, whether I want to be or not. I laugh because Charlie Shannon said, whenever, whenever they have a question on gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or AIDS, any politician in Somerville and a few other cities nearby, Bob's the one to call. And I never thought it would Your get phone to that must point. Be ringing off the hook. It does a lot. Um, I can tell a story now, I guess, back at Joe Kennedy. Um, someone in his office found out they were positive many years ago, and the first person I get on the phone, here's Joe Kennedy on my phone. What do we do? Uh, but that's good. It's, I'm glad that I came well, out with it know, as soon as I did. That's nice to know that, I mean, it must make you feel good to know that people can, that you're that approachable, that people can just pick up the phone and call you. Yep. If I can help them, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm there for. That's my whole purpose. Because it is a difficult situation for some people to talk about, and, you know, them feeling they can call you shows that you're caring and that you're compassionate and that you're someone they trust. Yep, and they know I'm going to be honest with them. I'm that's definitely not. a tribute to you. Um, what are your plans for the future of the committee? Um, just to go along slowly, raise mm -hmm. some more money and keep spending it. I'm doing a little less of the work myself. I raise the money and then give it away for others to do work with it. Mm -hmm. um, but local businesses and my friends have been very generous. We raise anywhere from fifteen to $25,000 a year and we use it. Um, for, like I said, all those crazy things, but no, I About how I many people stop. would you say you, you in any given year, year, each year? Probably a couple of weeks, so probably not count the dinners, because that would make it a huge number. Right, but I'm the, the actually two or three people gifts. every week in strangest sort really, of Really, every week? And around Christmas time, I'll probably do three or four hundred gift bags. Mm -hmm. um, we get all the stores help us, give us breaks, and we, we fill these fancy colored bags with nine, ten bucks worth of unusual items and give them out at um, living center parties or positive directions parties. Um, I'm going to give a lot of the turkeys we got this year out in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we also, we're, we're not always, even though it's the Committee for Response to AIDS, if we run into someone else that needs some kind of special help, we help. So we, we decided to branch out beyond AIDS and become a, a charity that's just there to, AIDS being our main thing, but there are other people that we can help and we do. For our viewers out there, um, we're going to talk to Bob a little bit more about the newspaper. And if anyone does have any information or any information they'd like about the Committee to Response to AIDS, you can always call Bob, I'm, I'm assuming, at the paper? Mm -hmm. So we'll lose. Okay. But just talking about the newspapers again, because I think it really is fascinating for someone like you, who's been in the newspaper business for so many years, and to see all these really mom-and-pop businesses, unfortunately, um, not be in business anymore because they've been just oversized by these conglomerates of newspapers who have come into town, sometimes not even knowing the local news. What do you think about that? How do you respond? I think it's made newspaperdom a, a much lesser place in this part of the country. Mm -hmm. um, there's so few cities with two local newspapers. The conglomerates do all these canned stories. They hire people, you know, they get a student from Albany and a student from Atlanta and a student from Wichita, none of which know whether it's town hall, city hall, or the big building on the hill. Um, they don't have the experience. And they, if you don't have the experience, or at least someone to give it to you, when I have a student come in and I've been in the city all my life, I can sit them down and give them a five or ten minute background so they at least Actually, know. Actually, just going to um, stop you for one moment. Do you take, do you have internships or do you, we just basically, just basically yeah. whoever if calls Anyone who wants up? to come in yeah. and takes a shot, we'll give them a shot. I believe yeah. in that. Um, anybody who wants to write a story, I won't guarantee them it gets in, but it mm -hmm. usually does. Um, we started a lot of people, there's four or five people writing at the Globe. There's a couple writing at the Herald that started writing at the Sumbul News first. Great. Because they get to learn the day-to-day -day operation and talk to real people in real time, mm -hmm. as opposed to going into cover a subject that they've never been to and never seen. And that's what happens with the conglomerates. In the Midwest, it's not nearly as bad. It's, there's still a lot of one, one owner papers. When I started the Summer News, the, most everybody was one owner. They might have two or three. A lot of family papers had two or three owners. Um, George Connors was the editor of the journal for 20 or 25 years. And he was the local community person, always there. And I, I guess I accidentally modeled myself after him. The big community papers, the ones that the Herald owns now, are not interested in the community. They are profit-making, and that's their only real interest. They don't care about anything else. And that's my, I'm exactly the opposite. I hope to make a profit in all this. I moan and groan about it. And most of my friends ask me how I've made a living for 20 years. We should years. actually point out, for those of you who don't know, is that um, the Somerville News is free as well. So Bob isn't, you know, he's really just in it for the good of Somerville. Um, 
you know, this isn't the most recent edition, but it will, most recent edition to look for will be coming out, hopefully, a full color front page, and I'm sure that will happen. But, you know, it's nice to see this is, this is free as well, and mm -hmm. it's nice, especially, I'm assuming, for the, the seniors who, who are used to reading and don't have the internet or the TV to watch. They, you know, they like to just pick up the paper and read their news, and here they can find yeah. all the local news. People in summer will know more about me than I do. They've been reading my columns for 32 <laughs> years. They've watched me grow up, and it amazes me. People come up to you me. on the street and they do, tell all the you time. about this column or tell you about that column. Or yes, and I like it when they do because it lets, if they don't like it or if I don't write my column, they stop me, mm -hmm. which proves to me they actually like it. And that's a good thing. Proves to you that they're reading. Yes, and they've got to keep reading. Which is something very good, too, that all of America should do is read. We're just about out of time, so I want to thank you, Bob, for being on Middlesex Update. You're welcome. Glad to be here. And this is one of our holiday shows, so do you have any holiday wishes you'd like to send out to the citizens of Middlesex County? Well, the citizens of Middlesex County, I wish a healthy, peaceful, prosperous new year and be glad to take your groceries at our office so we can donate them. <laughs> and is there a phone number they could... 617-666-40, the Somerville News. Great. I want to thank you for watching this edition of Middlesex Update. I'm Melissa Hurley. I want to thank my producer, Joe Fortunato, and we will see you again soon. Good night.